what was your writing style? Like, how did you write? Did you write by yourself? Were you like around other people? Did you, where were you drawing inspiration? Well, well, for me, you know, back in the day, I, I wrote my own rhymes, right? And for the guys, when we did routines together and harmonize together, we wrote the rhymes and the cadence together to harmonize, you know? And so um, everybody, everybody had their own rhyme that they would say, but the cadence of the style of rhyme to bring each other in was a collective amongst us all, you know? And so you write about what you felt at that time. You write about how, for me, it was like, it was the music. And so when I wrote my rhymes, I wrote my rhymes accordingly to the songs that I loved, where I would choose specific songs that I would like to rap to, right? So, or MC to. So that means that when you heard me, I basically like to, to, to choose songs that were crispy clear, where it didn't have as much, you know, music or sound behind it, where you can focus on what I'm saying and my voice and my deliverance you know, and my delivery when I'm delivering to you. So that's how I wrote according to the songs that I loved that was at the hip, hip in hip hop at that time. You understand? Okay. That, that was, that was synonymous with hip hop culture at that time. All right. So then with, uh, that's the joint. What, since that I would argue, of course, is probably your biggest, your guys' biggest song. Yes. Yes. What, yes. What was different in your opinion compared to the other singles you guys had, what made that one so different in your opinion? Well, with Rapping and Rocking Her House, that was our first song. That's the joint was our second, second song, but it was our first one under Sugar Hill Records. And the difference in that song is that at that time, Taste the Honey, yo, well, I mean, got to be real. I mean, Taste the Honey was, that's the joint, that was the song that was really like rocking at that time. But the cadence, and how the Funky Four and the Plus One More, we put that together was um, a way where we can get people to really listen to it and hone in on our skills as MCs. And I think that um, I, I seen somewhere, and, and, and you, we wasn't thinking at the time that that song was gonna be the synonymous song, you know, as opposed to all others, because, you know, we felt like all of our songs were good, but this was our first song on Sugar Hill, Sugar Hill Records. But also at the time we felt like, okay, this song is gonna represent our skills. And I think I seen many, uh, a couple of years ago where you, know, you had um, a, a writer that was a part of, um, what is that? Um, it's right on the tip of my, tip of my tongue, but um, they, they, they was writing about Rolling Stones. So they had a writer that was, that was writing for Rolling Stone magazine and um, I think our song was rated like number four, the, the number 46 or 43, something like that, the best hip hop song of all times. And so the writer actually said that, you know, the way that we were rhyming at that time, because we, we you know, this is, the, it came out in 80, right? The way that we were rhyming in time, the Funky Four Plus One was ahead of their time in the rhyming skills, you know, and so, that was one of the reasons why they said that, you know, that's the joint was one of the, 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 the top 50 rap songs of all times. And because we tried to um, choose a song or choose music that could show our skills and especially whatever song that was hot at that time, we went with it, you know, just like other people, you know, went with songs that was hot at that time. But it was like, how do you bring forth, you know, your skills and show that you know you hone you 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 hone your so you you could you could ride this beat like nobody else could and that's what we did and that's what was different you know I think you know with the cadence and as years go on with our other songs we just you know took took different approaches and just you know got a little bit better. I mean when we was doing those songs rapping and rocking the house and, and that's the joint we played out places where the normal hip hop artists wouldn't go. We were, we, were, we were the first ones to go down to the Ritz, Ritz Club, which was like an all white establishment, punk rockers. We, were, we was one of the first to go down to the Mud Club, punk rockers. This is where you see people like the Beastie Boys that was in a crowd. At that time, we didn't know about the Beastie Boys, but they knew about us. And so when you listen to, I think one year I seen on um, the v VH1 and 
you uh, had, you know, some of the Beastie Boys, you know, um, saying, well, like, well, who was your influence? They say the Funky Four Plus One. We didn't know at the time that they was in the crowd, you know, in those punk rocker places that we was playing. So we actually took hip hop and punk rock and brought it together. And you had them throwing everybody up in the air. You know, um, they were, uh, you know, like hollering and screaming and, you know, blowing whistles and they were having fun because we, it was something different from them, you know, bringing hip hop and punk rock together. So, and a lot of people don't know that and they don't speak on it. But when you talk about people like the Beastie Boys, they'll tell you, they've said that the Funky Four was their influence. Funky Four Plus One was their influence. Is yeah. that, um, have any relation to uh, Blondie getting you guys on Saturday Night Live or hosting you guys? Like um, I don't know if it was any relations because we were, or well, I should say, yeah, because we were playing down in those areas where she lived at down there. but. The connection for Blondie was Fat Five Freddy because she went to him as well and said, who's the top, you know, once again, rap group in the Bronx? He could have said Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five because I thought they was just as good as we was. But the Funky Four plus one more was the one that was able to perform on Saturday Night Live, you know, in, in 1981. That's you know, cool. and so the connection was Fat Five Freddy. So her, uh, Blondie and Bobby Robinson thinking the same thing. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. That's crazy. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think the reason why they did it is because even though, and, and the Furious Five is my family, you know what I'm saying? I always speak up for them. I, I speak up for the Cold Crush. I speak up for the Fantastic Five, Grand Wizard Theodore, you know, the Elberts. I speak up for them. But the people that was there know the true, the truth about who was the dominant groups that was back there. You understand what I'm saying? You could hear it on the, the, the cassette tapes. You know what I'm saying? They were selling cassette tapes like, you know, they were selling records. So it was like, you know how you have your mixtapes now and all of that stuff? That was the era of the mixtapes. Only they didn't call it mixtape. It was the era of the cassette tapes, which is the same thing now that you may say, the mixtapes, you understand? So they knew, they knew, they knew who was the prominent groups that was back there. And I'm not gonna ever take anything from anybody else, but the truth is the truth. And I think the reason why, you know, in, in each form from Bobby Roz Robinson to Deborah Harry, Blondie, the group Blondie, I think the reason why they chose us is because even though you had Grandmaster Flash was like, it's all in the Furious Five, which was an awesome group. We were more younger looking. We were more innocent looking, baby faces, and they had a female. That's what separated us all the time because they were able to show something different to the world that was well, never done before. Be, being incredible helps too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate you, I appreciate you. Yeah, so then- I appreciate you. With how did, because I know, you know, from talking to people and everything, the different types, you know, you're doing the, the punk rock clubs, you're doing skate rinks, you're doing high schools or whatever. Yes, yes. How and what did, if at all, like Saturday Night Live change? Did you guys get bigger venues? Did you do more shows? Did you do fewer because you were getting more? Um, you were traveling? Like what happened? What Saturday Night Live did for us, and I think more so than anything, um, was later on down the line because we still had the, the same people following us. You know what I'm saying? Because right after we did, um, we, actually we was on tour. We was on the first, when we did Saturday Night Live, we was on the first rap tour ever. And that was with uh, Sylvia Robinson, who was the Sugar, the Sugar Hill Records tour. You know, on that tour, we were already out on the road, which if people did see us, they saw us, you know, but we, we went, I think we went on like a 52 state, you know, something like that, you know, tour. So we went all around the world. We was going around the world on Sugar Hill Records. You know, on that tour was the Gap Band. It was the group Sky. It was Wayne and Charlie, which was a, a tranquil, you know, like the, the dummy tranquilicus. 
it was um, the Furious Five and the Funky Four. So we, if I would say that it would change, people probably knew us better and she was able to really sell the tour because, you know, of what it was. But we were already, already out on tour before we did Saturday Night Live. She had to bring us back in. We had to come off tour because we was out. And, and Blondie said, well, we, I'm a host in Saturday Night Live. Debbie Harry, I want them to be on Saturday Night Live. She tried to work out some stuff, you know, where the Sugar Hill Gang could get on there and all that stuff. But she didn't want that. They wanted the funky four plus one, right? So we got on there. And what happened was we had to come back off a tour to do Saturday Night Live, you know? And so we went back out on tour, but whether or not it did, you know, anything from us, I think at the time we didn't know that we were making history as being like the first hip hop group. You know what I'm saying? Not a, not a rapper, but the first hip hop group from the streets to New York, from those parks that was on national television, as opposed to anybody else. In 1979, you had, you know, a different groups come out like The Sequence, you had Lady B, you had, um, you know, other groups that came out. But the difference in the Funky Four and the Funky Four Plus One is that we were authentic MCs that was in the parks serving all elements of the culture. From the B-girl to the B-boy to the DJ to the MC, you know, to the graffiti. We were celebrating the, 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 the knowledge, you know, everything that had anything to do with hip hop, we were there. So we didn't come. And I know you may hear down the line and people that may be watching say, well, this person was there. But, you know, in 1979, this, but I was there before 1979, before rap records, authentic MC from the streets of New York. I didn't come into the game and just got on a rap song. I was that era that helped move that, that I was that female that helped move the culture forward from the battles to the way you dress. You understand what I'm saying? To the, to the MC styling, to the clothing, to the graffiti, all of that. I was that era that set up for every MC that's out there now. I was that, that female that did that. Along with, you know, the Funky Four and, and people like Grandmaster Vanessa Furious Five and, and uh, you know, other, you know, people that was out there with me, you know, on the ground. And it's crazy, too, when I think about it. And <clears throat> it's like when people like yourself are making history, like you said, you don't even know it because you're doing it. You know, it's, right. different, it's different to have five, ten years down the line. Wait a minute. Right. You know, right. And, and to be honest with you, Soren, it wasn't until probably like five, ten down the line. I think it was like for me, it was like 20 years down the line. And let me tell you why, because when the museums and all of these different types of people that were trying to preserve and under, try to understand what the culture was about back then and how all of this came into play, they like to start it from the 80s because they don't want to do the research. You understand what I'm saying? But it's not even hard to do the research. And they don't mention, they don't mention females. They say, okay, well, you know, it's, 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 it's the father hip hop, you know, and it's the guys, but they don't know that I was like right there with them on the ground floor, making it happen, moving it forward. You understand? Well, it wasn't why, nothing that, yeah, I, I didn't just, I didn't just come in the game as a, as a female. I was an equal. I helped move this culture forward. I was a part of everything. I helped to enlist everything that's a part of hip hop today. I'm not a pioneer. I'm a founding member of hip hop culture. And anybody that say different, I can prove it. Be sure to check out the history of gangster rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of gangster rap features exclusive interviews with Ice T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The history of gangster rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. I'm 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was, I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. There will be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that five on your TV basketball? Yo MTV it just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. There's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.